Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Andrea to you this morning. Andrea is here with us uh, for a year uh, from Brazil. Uh, she is a physiotherapist, a PhD, and she's here for the year doing some postdoctoral work. She's going to speak to us uh, this morning on some of the evidence uh, supporting uh, pelvic floor physiotherapy techniques. Uh, English is not Andrea's first language, and I know she's slightly nervous to be speaking to us in English, but I have every confidence that it will be fine. So, Andrea. Thank you so much for first starters. Thank you, everybody. Before I start, I'd like to thank Dr. Stotters for having accepted me at the Bellier Care Center. I'd like to thank all the Bladder Care Center staff for the warm, uh, warm welcome. I'd like to thank the Department of Urology. I'm very glad to know that the Department of Urology has this open mind to receive other professionals and discuss urinary incontinence from a different perspective. So, as Dr. Sutter said, I speak Portuguese. <laughs> it's my first class in English. So I already apologize for mistakes of pronunciations or something like that. Urinary continence is a multifactorial disease. International Continence Society recommends conservative treatment as a first line of treatment specific for stress urinary incontinence. Pelvic floor muscles play an important role in the maintenance of the continence. The first author who published something about the connection among pelvic floor muscles and urinary incontinence was Arnold Kegel in the 50s. Arnold Kegel had this idea that the pelvic floor muscles weakness comes from the woman evolution because in quadruped animal, the pubic oxygen muscles has the function of tail wagging. So when men and women adopt the upright position, the pelvic floor muscles got weak. Basic, uh, basic in these concepts that Kegel called attention, from the 50s to now, the physical therapists try to understand, based on concepts that we have among other different muscles from the body, how the concepts could be applied to pelvic floor muscles. So today, I'm going to talk about the concepts of skeletal muscle contraction, specificities of pelvic floor muscles, muscle repair and rehabilitation, physical therapy for pelvic floor muscles, and future perspectives. Muscle tissue is the major consumer of energy in women because it comprises one-third of the total body mass. It's not just for locomotion. We know that metabolic regulations are connected with muscle contraction. In tetraplegic people, uh, the disuse of the muscles leads to diabetes type 2. So what kind of influence can affect the muscle contraction performance? The ability for oxidative metabolism, an intact neuron control, power, muscle awareness, and coordination. I'm going through each, each of them. Oxidative metabolism. Tissues are able to control its own local blood flow. Higher the metabolism, higher the blood flow. In it, who is responsible for that is the microvascular unit regulation. As soon as the exercise starts, the units, microvascular units allow more blood to come and the oxygen can allow more exercise to be done. So uh, this has two, two phases, the acute control and a long-term control. In the long-term control, increases in the size and number of actual blood vessels supplying the tissues and growth of new blood vessels, what we call angiogenesis. When the exercise starts, it can increase more than 10 times the blood flow, and it's related with the intensity of the exercise. So the ability to sustain contractual activity of muscle, skeletal muscles is correlated with the capacity of aerobic oxidative energy metabolism. And it has to do with the type of muscular fiber. We know that genetic code under racial influence determines the amount of fiber type 1 or type 2. Usually, the muscles has an equal mixture of the, type, the fibers. A specific training can convert type 1 in type 2 fibers or vice versa. So muscular fiber type 1 contract slowly, tonic contraction, cont constant reflex, reflex input, 
generate energy for ATP via aerobic metabolism. <coughs> Muscular fiber type 2, the energy is predominantly generated anaerobically. It's a phasic contraction, quick and powerful contraction, and exerts 20% more force than the slow fiber. When somebody coughs, the type fiber, the, the fiber type 2 are recruited to allow the continence. So uh, the velocity of muscle fiber contraction also is different. The, uh, it varies among the motor units. Slow to each fibers are recruited first. Once an excitatory input increases, other mus motor units are recruited and stimulus achieve the fast to each fibers. In pubic oxygen muscles, only a small amount of fast switch fibers start the contraction. And to get the things worst in the incontinent people, an interval between stimulus and contraction in pelvic floor muscles is higher among urinary incontinence women, suggesting damage of the pull down nerve. For us physical therapists, damage of the pull down nerve is something very complicated because we know that the outcome of the rehabilitation has to do with the power of the, the pudendal nerve too. But you know that the uni motor unity of the pelvic floor muscles has the motor neuron inside the nucleus, the on-off nucleus, and has connection. The nerve innervates the muscle fiber. And in situations like a labor, there is a stretch, and 80% of these unities is going to be denervate. We know that it's very common it happens. And probably the worst part is in the second stage of the, the labor, when the head of the baby stretch the structures, and probably these units are separated. And many of these structures keep OK, but the denervate one is uh, uh, difficult our rehabilitation. You can see here in this picture the situation between bladder and vagina and rectus, and what happens when the uh, fetus, the, the head of the baby, goes to the vaginal canal. So many factors can influence this, this uh, situation. As uh, what is really proved is the age of the mother, how active this woman used to be, used to be before the pregnancy, the size of the baby, and how long do the labor takes, and many factors can influence that. So for us physical therapists, we are kind of trained to, to figure out <clears throat> when we do the digital exam in the patient, how much denervate the fiber is, the, the pelvic floor muscle is. Usually the techniques to evaluate the denervation of pelvic floor muscles is very invasive. So it's very important in our digital exam to figure out how much denervation we are against, we are fighting against in the rehabilitation program. And it helps us to choose between an electrical stimulation or just exercise. So denervation takes to atrophy, dysfunction, and fibrotic tissue. Um, how do the repair happen? Three weeks after delivery, many of these denervate fiber start to be renervated again. How does it happen? A healthy, slow fiber is nearby a, a slow fiber is nearby a fast one. When the woman starts to exercise or something like that, the healthy one will assume the role of the denervate one. So the, near, the, the new pelvic floor muscles is renervated again, but in a different design. It's a morphologically different design. So it's possible to recover after deliver, the delivery? Yes, it is. But we need to remember that the pelvic floor muscles is a little bit different. And because it has 70% of slow fiber, it's very probable that the new one will adopt the function of slow fiber and not fast fiber. These are things that the physical therapist has to have in mind when we develop a protocol of rehabilitation for the patient. So power. Muscle architecture and has to do with muscular power. We don't expect that a small muscle as a pelvic floor has the same power that a quadriceps muscles. 
but also the quality of contraction is also important. You know that to happen the contraction, it has to have an overlap about actin and myosin inside the sarcomere. So during the contraction, the overlap happens of actin and myosin and generates something that we call active tension inside the sarcomere. It has to happen starting from an optimal point. If the muscle is fiber is too stretched or too short, this contraction is not good. So we need to, we know the active tension decrease under muscles of stretching beyond 150% of its normal resting length. Also, we know that active tension is very low, very low when the tight part of contraction is around 70% of its normal resting length. So if you take this general, con general concept of muscular contraction to pelvic floor muscle, we can think about our patient with prolapse or overactivity of the pelvic floor muscles. This patient has a very dif has difficulties for contraction. So um, we know that uh, distensible and stiff muscle fiber decrease the ability to generate power. And patients with prolapse of pelvic organ are known to achieve poor results when submitted to exercise. If you see some, uh, this kind of schema from an ultrasound, you are going to see here, the first one, the normal bladder. Then, uh, Jason said I could, okay. Then what happens is the effect of the levator contraction acts on the urethra and lifts bladder base. In, prolapse pa in prolapsed patients, when you make the contraction, the effects of the levator contraction presses against a posterior <coughs> bladder wall. So prolapsed patients is not a good candidate for conservative treatment. On the other hand, overactive, pelv pel overactive pelvic floor muscles also presents with <coughs> muscular weakness and early fatigue. Um, we, we know the pathophysiology of stress and nerve incontinence that many factors can influence, as congenital anomalies, injuries and disease of the nervous system, abnormal, abnormalities of the bladder itself, age, menopause, habits of life, obesity, but the winner is still the childbirth and maternal injury. Connective tissue of the lower urinary tract is something that we physical therapists can't fight against because we work with straight muscles. And you know that uh, endopelvic fascia composition is elastina, collagen, and smooth muscles. So when the patient comes to us with a, uh, extensive damage of the connective tissue, she's not a good candidate for conservative treatment also. We can't help her too much. So the consequence of pelvic floor muscles are incontinence, pain, and prolapse, and sexual dysfunction. And we know that the good candidates for cons conservative treatments are the high risk continents that we call pregnant women, women who experience increase at abdominal pressure in occupational activities of manual labor, carrying weight, for example, women, uh, women who has asthma, bronchitis, and smokers, <laughs> obese, and also athletes, because it, it, all the time it's overlap, um, it's overloading the pelvic floor muscles. So the prognostic factors to conservative treatments are the severity of the dysfunction, the duration of the symptoms, and the hormonal status. But again, I need to remember that sometimes the factors doesn't help, but the outcome is good. Not the, the, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to improve patients that has the symptom for a long, long time. Sometimes we, we can improve these patients as much as patients that just start to feel the symptoms. So the factors to prognostic influ are influenced by the previous chirurgic procedures. We don't like to receive patients who went through many, many surgeries because we know that the, the situation, the tissue, the muscular tissue is different from patients that had never been in a surgery before. What we don't know is if the patients who exercise after the surgery, the recovery is quickly and better and no recidive. We always talk about that. We should study what happens if we exercise the patient before the surgery and if the outcome is different. 
we, we don't know. The general clinical conditions influence the, the prognosis of the, the, the rehabilitation. And also motivation of the patient and the therapist. Sometimes the patient doesn't go, want to go to conservative treatment. They want surgery. So for sure it's not going to work. The patients need to, to want that because she is the one who is going to do that exercise. So physical therapy has many different techniques for help these people. Active exercise, biofeedback, vaginal cones, electrical stimulation. Electrical stimulation is not the focus of today, but electrical stimulation is a powerful tool among the physical therapists because not just we can contract muscles that are denervate, but also we can inhibit smooth muscles as the trussor. So we can use electrical stimulation in overactive bladder. What we'd like to do, how to do, is to contract smooth muscles, smooth muscles. So probably we could help you guys in the hypoactivity detrusor, but we don't know that how to do that yet. So the, among the different techniques we have, electrical stimulation, there are many devices of electrical stimulation available. This is one from Brazil, but you have many different devices here. The vaginal conus is not very popular in South America. It's very popular in North, North America probably because it's expensive for our population. Biofeedback is something very powerful. What? As you can see here, this is a patient who works with fast fibers, and you can say to her, you need to go on this line. And now we are going to work with what? the slow fibers, and she's going to keep the contraction, keep the contraction, keep the contraction, and then relax. Right? So we can de design a protocol based on what we find in our patient. The stage for rehabilitation, the first one is information. It's proved that the patients that understand what's happening with her changes everything. There is the di mictional diary that you guys know that. The mictional diary is many different types of mictional diaries. Some of them is very complicated to fill. You need to, to write uh, the amount of urine, the amount of water, the but it doesn't have to be complicated. We have one here that we use to people who doesn't know how to read very well. And you, it just show pictures of situations. The first one is a normal voiding. The second one is a stress urinary incontinence. The, the, this one is a urgency, urge incontinency, nocturia and enuresis, nocturnal enuresis. And on the other side of the paper, the patient just write what time happened what. This, this kind of dictionary, the dictionary diary can be used with children too. So um, the second stage for rehabilitation is the postural balance. And it's very controversial among the physical therapists because what is proved is that the pelvic floor muscles helps the continence. But we try to figure out other types of muscles that can be around and can influence changes in the the this pressure of the abdominal and everything, especially the transverse of abdominal. And also, we try sometimes to discuss if movements of the leg can help or not to help the contraction of pelvic floor muscles, like internus obturator or piriformi or something like that. So it's not proven and it's controversial among the, the physio. Uh, Cochrane has at least three or four uh, uh, systematic review about the, the, the pelvic floor muscles and urinary incontinence. The last one is an update done by Dumoulin and Hayes Mead. And he used 40 trials, and almost 800 patients uh, participate in this uh, systematic review. And the pelvic floor muscle training more likely to report they were cured and or improved and presented better quality of life. So the tendency is pelvic fitness class, combining a total body fitness program with education about bladder anatomy and bladder health. If you had the opportunity to be at ECS in San Francisco, probably saw many of the people who went and received a, a video, a DVD, about an exercise class and how the patient could take this video to home and to exercise and everything. Um, this is a kind of uh, therapy that's very popular because it, it optimizes the treatment and it's cheaper for the, for the service. And sometimes I think it's funnier for the patient, but also it depends on the type of patients and everything. Proprioception is something very important, and Kige was right. 
usually the women know how to contract everywhere except the pelvic floor muscles. You need to, to teach, their, to teach her exactly what to do. This is why sometimes we just give papers to the patient, send her home and say, you need to contract your pelvic floor muscles and it doesn't work because she's not doing correctly. Somebody needs to teach her exactly how to do that to, to, to work, otherwise it's not going to work. The fourth stage is muscular strengthening. There are three, three principles for put the muscle stronger. The first one is overload. It means the muscle needs to work more then it uses it to work, but it can't fatigue. fatigue. The second one is specificities. Uh, and it's very interesting to talk about exercises, specifically this week, Dr. Vandenberg, that we are starting the Olympic Games. But specificities mean if I want to train a runner, I can't put him swimming, <coughs> even if both of them are aerobic exercise. So the best way to improve the pelvic floor muscles is, is still Kegel from the 50s to now. So the, the last one is reversibility. It means as soon as I stop exercise, the effects will stop too. So the exercise that I do today, it's good for today and this week, but the next week I need to exercise again. The patient needs to understand that. And use, something that we used to do is to teach, to teach her how to exercise in activity that, that she used to meet, leak before. Let's, say, let's think about the patients that complain that she leaks when she's climbing a stairs. You can just, uh, okay, is it working? Work? Yes. So the patients climb a stair and you can see in the biofeedback she's contracting the pelvic floor muscles. Right. And you're trying to teach her every time she climbs a stairs she needs to contract the pelvic floor muscles forever. Work? <laughs> so this is a kind of, we, we call functional and right. therapy. Okay, how the training works. The training works increasing the strength of the muscle fiber through a neural adaptation, increasing the rate of motor unit excitation, increasing the synchronized motor unit fire, and persistent activation of type 2 motor. Motor unit. Okay, the motor unit. Increasing the fiber size means hypertrophy. Regular and intense training for eight weeks causes hypertrophy. And there is an impact at the muscular oxidative capacity, which is the best protocol for pelvic floor muscles. We don't know. What we do know is that fatigue may be the reason why pelvic floor muscles exercise fails and urinary incontinence occurs and must be avoided in the rehabilitation program. So see, you know that we must exercise these people, but we don't know how many contractions they need to do. So we do know how other types of muscles should exercise. The American College of Sports Medicine recommends one to two sets, eight to 12 repetitions, eight to 10 different exercise per session, two or three times a week. But what about, pelv what about pelvic floor muscles? The literature is very interesting. It comes from five to 200 contractions of pelvic floor muscles per day. Actually, there is an one author who suggests 10 contractions each half an hour. It means that the patients need to keep exercising all the day, what is very complicated, right? So to answer this question, we are trying to, we are starting a study at Bladder Care Center, me and my group here. So we are going to evaluate the oxygen consumption of the pelvic floor muscles during exercise in continent and incontinent women using NEARS, Near Infrared Spectroscopy, and it's a pilot study. So the NEARS, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but NEARS and his equipment who use light in the near infrared spectrum around 700 to 1,300 <coughs> nanometers to monitor change in the local blood flow and detect the difference in the tissue oxygen delivery and consumption and utilization. The, uh, the parameters of interest are related to microvascular function in the NEARS. We are going to assess the recovery interval of muscle oxygenation at the muscle reoxygenation rate. And we are going to ask to answer and to contribute answering this question, which is the best protocol for, for contraction. And you, we would like to ask you 
to help us to answer this question and send patients for a study, because we need patients for a study. It's going to start in two weeks, and we would like to ask you to help us with these patients. So this is like to say to, say, to tell you, thanks very much. I'm supported by CAPS, and this is the hospital where I came from in Brazil, Caisme is the name. Thank you for everybody.